Scoundrel Four. 19, Sergeant Roll 10. Mark it, please. Um, my husband, Tex Goldschmidt, and I. Let's stop. Cut? No. Okay. It's another thing that we have to pick up. Mark it. Take two. Just a second. Okay. I was one of a group of young people who went to work for the New Deal in 1934. Uh, we were very uh, gung-ho, very excited about our work. Uh, many of us were lawyers. I was not, but the, it included the young lawyers. And we knew who we were. We, w our whole life was centered in our work. When we had parties, we'd talk about our work. So um, we uh, developed a kind of philosophy that has come to be called the New Deal philosophy, that government existed to help people, that we hoped we were creating institutions that would continue uh, into the future beyond the immediate emergency. Uh, in, the, in my case, it would have been uh, hope for a permanent, uh, maybe, work program, relief program, ultimate, what ultimately became the Social Security program. Uh, we, we were not compartmentalized in our thinking. We had jobs to do, but we exchanged our thoughts. Can you tell me what the basis of that spirit, of that, um, of that feeling was? I mean, where did that come from? Well, it was partly revolt against the Hoover philosophy, which was that the government should do the least possible, that people should look after their neighbors, the private agencies should take care of everything. We had a totally different philosophy, and that was the theory that government was uh, there to help people when they needed it, and to protect them, to succor them if they were poor. Uh, generally a positive attitude toward the role of government. Now, you came and you worked under um, Harry Hopkins in the FERA. What can you tell me about Mr. Hopkins in terms of the kind of man, the kind of administrator he was? Mm. Well, Harry Hopkins was a very uh, charismatic man. People responded to him uh, with great loyalty, devotion, wanting to help carry out his ideas. Uh, he, uh, he had a, a loose theory of administration. He, he would tell us what he wanted, and then it was up to us to carry it out. Uh, his ideas were primarily, let's get this money out. He was very conscious that there were millions of people who'd lost their jobs, who had no income, whose children were hungry. And this really was our emotional uh, mechanism. Uh, he, he wanted to have a minimum of constraints, but he had certain uh, basic rules that had evolved in the first days of the system. One was that our money was only to be spent by governmental agencies, federal, state, and local, that responded to the uh, people, were accountable to the people. Uh, Hoover's idea had been you did it through private agencies, if any. Ours was that this was government money and it should be spent through public agencies. Uh, a second, uh, he, he, he wanted an honest administration, but the least uh, people, the least constraints uh, possible. Uh. Stop, let's stop for a second. Okay, it's okay. And you want me to remind you the other two? Mark it. Take three. Uh, Mr. Hopkins. Okay, now we can go. Mr. Hopkins was a very charismatic man. People responded to his directness, his leadership qualities, his warmth. And uh, he had, but he had certain basic principles. One of them was that our money should only be spent by public agencies, federal, state, and local, that were responsive to the uh, 
to, to public bodies uh, was tax money, and therefore we were answerable for it. Uh, on the other hand, he did not want a tight administration. He wanted everything done as directly and as uh, simply as possible. Uh, he was very, ins he was, it was a basic rule that our money was given in currency, in, in cash or checks, but not in food or shelter or such, except for the transient program, which I was responsible for. Uh, he was generally motivated by a very strong sense of the compelling need and the great urgency of getting this program moving. Now, there was criticism of Mr. Hopkins and FERA and CWA. How did he respond to that criticism? Well, he, he recognized that it existed, but he took it very lightly, the criticism that came. Uh, it it uh, was mainly that uh, this was a socialistic program, that it was uh, uh, an invasion of uh, freedom of uh, people to give their, as they willed. Uh, there was some criticism that we were uh, political or corrupt, though most of that was proven to be incorrect. Uh, he had a rather uh, debonair attitude. He, he uh, had a tremendous liking for pleasurable activities. He would go to the races, go sailing with some of his richer friends, but he made he created an atmosphere of dedication to work. At some points in our history, we would be working really literally around the clock. We would have people scheduled for all hours of the day and night. As an administrator, you know, working in that office, what was the environment like working for FERA? Uh, well, we had very few people, so uh, the atmosphere was one of each person taking responsibility for his own uh, task. Uh, I think we were remarkably efficient considering our lack of experience. This was a wholly a new development. I was very young at the time. I was 24. Um, Uh, we had things coming at us, mail, directives, requests for funds, uh, questions of administrative policy. There was never a let up in that. I had two secretaries I kept busy all the time. Now, Mr. Hopkins had occasion to deal with one Fiorello LaGuardia. Can you give me your first impressions of him and what you thought of LaGuardia? Well, our relationships with LaGuardia in the first instance were rather indirect because we worked through the state to the locality. So we were dealing with then Governor Lehman and through him to LaGuardia. But later it became obvious that New York City was such a special problem, presented so many difficulties or questions that we developed a direct line to LaGuardia. And it was not an easy relationship. There were always tensions. He, he was very uh, independent, self-willed, uh, didn't want to take instructions from Washington. We had our rules that had to be followed. So there was a a kind of tension all the time. You had relayed to me a telephone conversation. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, one time uh, he was talking with Aubrey Williams on the telephone. LaGuardia was talking to Aubrey Williams on the telephone, and I happened to be listening in, and it was a very uh, direct uh, confrontation with epithets and so forth floating back and forth. That was fairly characteristic of LaGuardia. Okay, I need for you to tell me that again, but also define who Aubrey Williams was. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. 
Uh, my immediate boss was the deputy administrator of FERA, Aubrey Williams, and um, much of our contact with the local and state administrators was handled by Aubrey Williams. I was his assistant, really his alter ego. Uh, and uh, one time I happened to be listening into the telephone, which I often did when he was talking to LaGuardia, and it was a very uh, spirited, to say the least, confrontation with epithets back and forth. But in the end, uh, we got what we wanted. We have okay. like about 15 feet. Okay. This is great. Alright. Mark it, please. Camera roll 20, sound roll 10. Okay, hit it. 11 or 7. Um, in, in the middle of, uh, in, during the winter of 33 uh, 34, it was agreed that uh, we would undertake a very large work program, and in order to finance that work program, money would be transferred from the PWA to the FERA in order to create a new uh, emergency work program called the Civil Works Administration, or the CWA. Uh, that was a program that employed four million people in four weeks, a really fantastic job of administration. It was all federal, they got federal checks. They didn't have enough federal checks to pay four million people. They had to go out and uh, construct them somehow. Uh, th then these checks w would pass around in the community and there wasn't enough room for the signatures so they had to append extra paper to get all the, all the endorsements that. Uh, so it was obviously serving the purpose, which was to create a, a large impact of uh, consumer spending power that would help to get the economy moving again. Uh, naturally, uh, this helped to strengthen a well-known conflict uh, between Ickes and Hopkins, uh, one of the famous uh, confrontations of the New Deal. Uh, that was originally and deeply based in a different attitude toward employing people in the public uh, programs. The P PWA, the Public Works Administration, carried on very large projects like bridges, dams, and so forth that required a long lead-in time because there had to be engineering plans and other uh, time-consuming uh, preliminaries. The, w the FERA and later the WPA uh, had labor-intensive projects. Our whole purpose was to employ people. We had a limited amount of money for supervision and uh, non-labor costs. But our big goal was to get money into the hands of the working people. Well, that created a natural uh, confrontation, if you will, between the two of them. Uh, and uh, a constant effort to get uh, Roosevelt's support for a bigger program of one or the other. It also is reflected in Congress. Uh, I, I was uh, a part party to a time when the appropriation bill uh, was before Congress, which it was about every three months because we had only limited money. Uh, and so Mr. Biter, Congressman Biter of Buffalo, had moved to transfer money from WPA to the PWA. Let's stop for a second. Okay, cut. Because we're getting we're getting these alphabets mixed up. You know, we were talking about money from people. Mark it, please. Take five. One of the great natural conflicts that occurred in the New Deal period was the.
differences between Ickes, and who was head of the Public Works Administration, and Hopkins, who was head of the FERA. The FERA also had a work program, but the great emphasis in our program was on getting people to work, paying the money out to the workers whose families needed it, uh, whereas ICUS had big projects like bridges, dams, and so forth that required intensive preparation by engineers and the like. Uh, so in uh, 19, uh, the fall of 1933 uh, and into 1934, uh, Hopkins persuaded Roosevelt to take some of the money that had been appropriated for PWA, which was also available for transfer to other federal agencies, and transfer some of that money to the FERA for a crash work program, which did take place under the name of the Civil Works Administration, or CWA. And uh, that program, which was one of the miracles of the New Deal, put four million people to work in four weeks and was uh, exemplified the, the difference of philosophy b between Ickes and Hopkins. Now, you gave me a little, of, a little of it before, but I'd like for you to give me a little more regarding criticism of Harry Hopkins as a socialist and uh, his program has been socialist and communist and going beyond the bounds of government. You don't want anything on, chi on political uh, critis criticism? Yes, political criticism. You want that too? Yes. All right. I, I can't tell you about what I did on that because I did it in 1938. That would be too late. I'll just talk about it in general. Okay. <clears throat> Are we running? Yes. Uh, there were many criticisms of Hopkins and the FERA as being socialistic, uh, upsetting the standards of wages, relation of the sexes and of the races, uh, actual uh, cheating, though there was very little of that, but uh, political opponents would naturally pick on this large expenditure as a natural place for corruption. We didn't have any corruption, really, but uh, that was common criticism. He, he didn't take it very seriously. He, he would laugh it off. Now, when you first came to uh, the administration, we were involved in the results of that first hundred days legislation. Mm -hmm. um, how did that feel and, and being, being part of that, that whole um, New Deal administration? I mean, did you feel like um, that Roosevelt and these programs could actually solve the ills of the country? Well, as I said earlier, we were a group of young people. Most of us, for most of us, this, this was our first job. And uh, we were terribly wrapped up in what we were doing, very excited about it, felt that the future of the world depended upon us. We also hoped that we were creating a new kind of government, that these institutions with which we were associated might go on uh, to form permanent uh, programs. The FERA especially was a, a birthing place, as it were, for many programs like the Social Security Act. The, the group that planned that was financed by the FERA, the Economic Security Committee. Uh, food stamp programs were begun under FERA. Uh, many innovative uh, programs started under the FERA. The final question. When you think about the New Deal, what makes you most proud? Well, I, I was proud of everything, but particularly that we were able to do so much with so little staff and uh, 
so little time and how we moved in on uh, with uh, enthusiasm, dedication. We worked day and night uh, to uh, get our uh, program established, running in good order. Mark it, please. Take six. Just a second. Just a second. Okay. Uh, I came to work for the uh, FERA, the Federal Emergency Relief Administration, in September of 1933. I worked in the transient division. What did Harry Hopkins look like? What was he? Harry Hopkins was a very charismatic man. He was very uh, loose in his appearance, uh, maybe a little sloppy, uh, very relaxed, uh, debonair. His office was very uh, meager. He wouldn't have good office furniture because he said that that would make the Congress think he was wasting the relief money. Uh, his whole attitude was one of a concentration on the job, lack of self-consciousness. Okay. Is anyone else? One, sound roll one. Mark it, please. 318. Mark it. Okay. So we're going to go up to... We're in 37, the WPA is getting cut. It's the middle of the recession. I assume they know what the WPA is by this point. Yes. I don't have to say no. that. Okay, so can you tell me about the WPA cuts and your opposition to it? Uh, yes, in 1937, uh, the depression was, the recession was hurting, and uh, Congress... So start it again by... Reset, instead of uh, depression, yeah. reset, yeah. All right. In 1937, the recession was taking over, and Congress was very anxious that everything should be cut. So Roosevelt decided that we would have to reduce our roles by a substantial number of people. We allocated money by in terms of people. So each of the five regional directors were given a quota of people they had to cut. And uh, they did it in different ways. I remember one region where the social worker in charge said, well, we just pull every eighth card, and we think that's the fairest way to do it. And um, were you opposed to the cuts? Well, all of us in the WPA, including Hopkins, were basically terribly opposed. But he, of course, had to follow the president's wishes, and uh, so we had to follow his decision. We had no choice in the matter. Why were you opposed? Because the need was still there. Okay, can you tell me the that people that? were being cut off arbitrarily uh, who were still very much in need of the income that it represented. Okay. Let's, again, I kind of interrupted you as you were speaking. Tell me again why, you know, what the WPA still represented the people and why it was a problem that it was being cut. All right. Uh, the WPA was still the main source of income for, for those people who were receiving it. And cutting it meant that they were once more adrift and had to go on direct relief or some other form of income. Did you feel it was kind of undermining it? I mean, in a way that you had gotten so far and then you were going backwards again? Well, uh, many of us had hopes that it might become permanent, uh, and uh, this, of course, was really a sign that it was going to come to an end. Okay, may I ask you to say that again? Instead of saying it, to say many, many of us hope that the WPA. All right. Uh, many of us hoped that the WPA might become a permanent institution for taking care of unemployed people. So we saw this as a beginning of the end, really. Um, can you tell me about Hopkins' role in the 1938 election? Uh, yes, uh, Hopkins uh, 
was blamed by, uh, charged by many people with uh, playing politics with the WPA, particularly in relationship to two senatorial campaigns, that of Senator Guffey in Pennsylvania and Senator Barkley in Kentucky. So uh, I was asked, uh, as the person who did most of the writing uh, of that kind, to write a letter which could be inserted in the, with the payroll check of every WPA worker. I happened to be in the hospital at the time having my first child, but I wrote this and I was very, very careful. I said, you, the WPA worker, have the right to vote for anyone you want. Don't let your boss or anyone tell you anything different. And this went out to every worker. After a little while, we began getting many, many letters, some of them from blacks. Oh, great day coming. Now we can vote. I took your letter to the courthouse, but he said it wasn't so. <laughs> and then we also had complaints from p politicians that we had not considered the, uh, but the laws of the state. It was a case of complete... Uh, blinders. Uh, I was thinking about only one thing and not thinking about discrimination. I would actually like you to tell me part of that story again by um, telling me, by reminding me the fact that if I did not know this, that blacks, you know, that there was problems with blacks being able to vote, you know, at, at that time. Some yes, I better tell that after I tell about the letters or before. Yeah, well, you could tell after, but explain it a little bit more. All right, okay. Uh, Mr. Hopkins asked me, uh, though I was in the hospital having my first child, to write a letter that could go with the paycheck of every WPA worker. So I thought very carefully, and I wrote something like this, Dear WPA worker, you have the absolute right to vote for any candidate of your choice. Don't let your boss or anyone else tell you anything different. Uh, it was a very clear letter, but I had forgotten that most blacks were prevented from voting in the South, and uh, we began getting letters. Dear Mr. Hopkins, great day coming. Now us blacks can vote. Uh, I took your letter to the county courthouse and showed it to them, and they said it wasn't true at all. And what did Hopkins think about that when that happened? I don't know what he thought because I was in the hospital. All right, <laughs> I, I didn't hear about it until later. I I felt very uh, guilty that I had forgotten this important fact. <laughs> um, but why was it necessary to have even written that letter? Because he was trying to allay. Uh, because who was trying to allay? Because it was necessary because Mr. Hopkins was trying to counteract the charges that we were playing politics with the election. Okay. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the Federal Theater Project? Uh, yes. Well, the Federal Theater Project was very important as a symbol. Many people knew about it who know nothing else about the WPA. Many people were under the impression that this was going to be a new national theater, such as they have in France and other places. But actually, we thought of it as simply a means of employing unemployed actors. In any event, when the reductions in WPA came about, there was strong pressure in Congress to eliminate the project altogether. And they eventually did. I happened to be in the gallery of the House of Representatives when that vote took place. I was sitting with Hallie Flanagan, whom I had known at Vassar and had recommended for her job. And she was shaking so with such anger at the debate that the whole uh, balcony seemed to shake with her horror. Tell me a little bit about this again, about being sitting next to, to Hallie Flanagan. Um, what was the debate about? It was about the WPA Theater Project. Yeah, do you remember any of the issues at all, or why she was so angry about it? Uh, where do I go back to? Oh, just say, I was sitting next to... I was sitting next to Hallie Flanagan, the director of the program, whom I had known at Vassar and recommended for the job. And she was so angry at this debate, which centered in such matters as who was or was not a communist or otherwise unacceptable, uh, that she was shaking. And the whole 
balcony seemed to shake with her anger. And did this, so the, the Federal Theater Project was affected by the red baiting? The red yes, baiting? very. It was strongly affected by the general uh, wave of red baiting that took over, particularly in. Can you tell me again, by, instead of saying it, by saying the Federal Theater Project? Begin as a sentence. Yeah. The Federal Theater Project was especially affected by the wave of red baiting that took over in many public programs, especially in New York City. Okay. And do you know why, why was this considered so controversial? Why was the Federal Theater Project? Well, uh, in, in the beginning, the Theater Project was considered controversial because it was so innovative. It went down new paths, particularly the uh, living newspapers, which dealt with current issues. And uh, that, together with the general fear of communism, which was put forward in this context, uh, created a great uh, agitation against it. Was Hopkins able to save the um, uh, Federal Theater Project, or was it was it beyond? Uh, I. I don't believe that Hopkins could have saved the Federal Theater Project. It was uh, too conspicuous, too controversial, but basically it was a part of the general attack on WPA and the uh, desire to reduce the whole program. There were two different conceptions of the theater project. Some people thought it was going to be a national theater. Uh, and other people realized that it was really just a part of the program of making jobs for the unemployed. Did you feel like um, with these cuts happening and the um, sac and the elimination of the Federal Theater Project, that um, the WPA was kind of getting out of con out of your control? That you were kind of so much that you all had worked for was all of a sudden being taken out by Congress or? There was a general feeling in the WPA that uh, it was going to, it was nearing its end and that the things that we had worked for and our hopes that it might become permanent were obviously going to be uh, finished. Okay. Um, um, do you remember that, um, back to the, uh, the hearings on, on the Federal Theater Project, did Halle oh, Sorry, I just cut. Oh. Did it change roles? Okay. It's fine. I think we're okay. Okay. Yeah. I was just actually adding another. Mark it, please. Okay. Just a second. I still have John Tanner frame. Okay. Well, I'll just okay. you can finish my question. Mm -hmm. Again, place me back in 1934. Uh, what um, people uh, that had their hopes raised a little bit by CWA mm -hmm. and now. The hopes are shattered again. Mm -hmm. What was the conditions like? Mm -hmm. yes, you can In 1934, uh, unemployment was still extremely widespread. I, millions were still unemployed. The FERA was still giving relief. But CWA, the big work program that had employed four million people, had come to an end. And there was a sense of despair that this hopeful uh, program uh, existed no longer. But uh, at the same time, there was planning for a new work program, which became the WPA, or Work Projects Administration. Other plans were also going forward uh, for uh, new and more permanent programs, particularly the planning for the Social Security Act which went on in 1934. Uh, that program, as you know, uh, provided insurance against un long-term unemployment, uh, old age uh, insecurity, and... Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you again to just tell me what Social Security encompassed because you referred to as you know, and so, like, you're speaking to me for the first it, you should actually be speaking to me right now, mm -hmm. like you're talking to me. Well, I'm day. trying to get into that, but I'll do it again. Where Where do you want me to start? What Social Security encompassed. Mm -hmm. The Social Security Act, in its or original form, covered uh, three general types of protection. 
social insurance against long-term unemployment, against old age uh, needs, and against uh, people who are in actual need because of immediate need, because of old age, uh, death of the family breadwinner, really life insurance and blindness. What's the concept of security, social, the security of social insurance? Was that a new concept at that time? Uh, n it was the concept of social insurance was new for the United States, but had actually been initiated in Germany under Bismarck in around 1875, and had also been uh, started in England and many other countries, but for us it was a new concept. The concept was that during your working years, you contributed to a fund out of which you were paid uh, benefits uh, in your... Just stop for a second. Okay, that. Yeah. Slave, please. Okay. We'll begin again with mm -hmm. the concept of social insurance. The concept of social insurance is that during your working life, you and your employer contribute into a fund out of which you are paid on retirement because of old age. Uh, well, the original act was only for old age. So it was a kind of deferred wage. The program was small in the beginning because it only covered industrial workers. It was later to undergo a great enlargement, but it, the principle of uh, insurance was established in 1935. There was also a related program of assistance for needy people uh, who were in need because of old age uh, widowhood uh, or blindness. Place me back though in 1934 and, and I mean was this really like significant, was this something that was never done before in the United States about social insurance? Was this like a revolutionary almost new? Oh program? I didn't mention unemployment insurance did I? You can mention it when you... All right. You know. Should I go? Yes. Uh, the insurance program also included a program of unemployment insurance which had started in Wisconsin and had therefore the Wisconsin program had a considerable influence on the long-term program of unemployment insurance. Mm -hmm. But let me just go back just, I mean, to what I was asking about what it may have felt like to have had these programs in 1934. Was this a, a, just a complete change in the United States from what had happened before? Mm -hmm. Were people, did, it, did, did ordinary people really feel that this was going to make a difference in their lives? Uh, yes, you want me to start as if I had not mentioned social insurance before? All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Just to you know, address the impact, the importance of, of the, the concept again. Uh, in 1934, uh, when the big Civil Works Administration program employing four million people came to an end, there was a rather despairing discouragement what was going to follow. However, at the same time, uh, there was the beginning of planning for a new program of social insurance, uh, which we had not hitherto had on a national level. Uh, we had had a small program in Wisconsin for unemployment insurance, but otherwise it was new to the United States. It had existed in Germany under Bismarck and forward from about 1875, so it was not new to the world, and it had also been uh, developed in England. But people in this country did not know much about it because it was a brand new idea for us. So there had to be a considerable period of education, reassurance. Uh, another problem about insurance was that since it was based on contributions from one's working years into a fund out of which payments would be made when your work was interrupted, 
it involved a period of, it was a future thing and not an immediate thing. People were worried about their immediate needs, which continued to be met by the FERA, but they had to learn about what was going to come to them in the form of social insurance after this fund had had time to build up. Okay, I'm going to ask you this, Bill, in, in a slightly different way. If, if I am, you know, um, um, a person of, you know, 40 years old in 1934, and so, so, and, and when I start hearing Roosevelt talking, giving speeches about the idea of social, you know, insurance, does this, does, does it impact me? Do I think that maybe I'm going to have a new future? Is there a feeling that, that it removes some of the insecurity, you know, in life? There is this problem of delay that I tried to refer to. Should I just assume I'm going on from there? Yes. Well, at the same, at the same time that there was this uh, looking forward to the future, uh, people did begin to feel a, some, some reassurance that here was a permanent program of the federal government that would eventually protect their old age when they retired or would give them benefits when they became unemployed. Okay. Um, we talked a little bit about some of um, the goals of the FERA, but I, what I want to know is what was your vision, what, what, when you were working for the FERA and when you were, you know, thinking about the ideas of Social Security and to the Committee on Economic Security, what vision did that give you of a new society? Of a society? Did you, did you, could you at that time see a different kind of society than you were living in at that point? Did you have a vision of what it would look like? Mm -hmm. uh, well, during the early years that I was working for the FERA, our whole attention was centered on the fact that people were hungry, didn't have a place to live. We had to get the money out <coughs> to... Uh, get them over the hurdle, uh, <clears throat> but at that time... Can we start again? Do you want to get uh, water? Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's stop. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Change roles. Yeah, we change roles. Okay. In this case, you're... Moving on to camera roll two mm -hmm. on okay. scene 101, take three is up. Mark it, please. Just a second, let Dr. sit down. Okay, anytime. Okay. So I was asking you back on your own personal vision. Mm -hmm. In the early days of the FERA, we were so aware, so constantly besieged by uh, the needs of people for food and clothing and shelter. I was personally responsible for, among other things, for the supervision of the mailroom. We received 3,000 letters a day and many of them were, most of them were extremely pitiful. I used to read through a cross-section of them, pick out samples of letters that were vivid and uh, pass them on to Aubrey Williams and to Harry Hopkins and to Mrs. Roosevelt and to President Roosevelt because I felt that gave the, uh, the real flavor of what was actually happening. Uh, after the uh, remarkable program of CWA, Civil Works Administration, when four million people had been given work with wages uh, for a short period of time in an effort to stimulate the economy, there was a feeling of great discouragement that this program on which we put so much hope had come to an end. But at the same time, we were beginning planning for a new work program, which became the WPA, and for permanent measures that were incorporated ultimately in the Social Security Act. A committee on economic security was established with funding from the FERA. Francis Perkins was the chairman, Harry Hopkins was a member, and it was their assignment to plan a permanent social security program. Social insurance had existed in Germany from Bismarck's time in 1875, 
uh, and in England and other countries, but it was a new idea for the United States. We really had had only a small program for unemployment insurance in Wisconsin, but no national program. Uh, the idea of social insurance is that workers during their working years and their employers make contributions into a fund and out of that fund payments are made when they become unemployed uh, or uh, retire in old age or the uh, family breadwinner dies and it becomes a kind of uh, insurance uh, like life insurance. Uh, this program was enacted in 1935, and, uh, but it was relatively small in the beginning, and people had to think into the future, so a big educational effort was undertaken. But I think they did begin to feel that this was permanent, this was part of the federal structure, and that it was something on which to build, as indeed it has been. That's great. Um, but tell me, what did you did you have an idea like what you thought the United States would look like in five years from then, ten years, twenty? Did, <laughs> well, did, now I know what happened under Social Security, right. so it's very hard what, not to uh, say. But did you have? A, I mean, did you have? Uh, I mean, could you formulate a picture in your mind of what you were striving mm -hmm. for personally? Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, during all this period, I was personally hoping that we would achieve a nation in which there was no insecurity, where people would have an, a dependable source of support uh, in times of unemployment. Of course, we also hoped there wouldn't be unemployment on the scale we'd had it, that the economy would be regularized and that... Uh, we would have only intermittent transitional unemployment or employment due, unemployment due to old age, disability, and so forth. That was our hope for the Social Security program, that that would take care of that, as indeed it has. Okay, great. You mentioned Frances Perkins, um, and I think that I asked you, I'd like, well, I'd like to ask you, sometimes they say that, that um, sometimes you hear that that Roosevelt didn't necessarily want to enact the Social Security program, that he had to be pushed into it. What do you, what do you feel about that? And, and, and please, if you can, mention Frances Perkins in mm -hmm. your answer. Well, Frances Perkins, who was Secretary of Labor and who became Chairman of the Committee on Economic Security, had worked for Roosevelt in New York, and he knew her and she knew him. And she certainly had this vision of a permanent Social Security Act in her mind uh, during the whole uh, emergency period from the 30s forward. So she must have discussed it with him and with Mrs. Roosevelt, and he must have been aware of it. Uh, I don't, of my own knowledge, know the details of that, but I'm sure he did know. So you believe, and if you can refer to he as, as Roosevelt, or right, I'm sorry. You answer. So you believe that that in appointing Francis Perkins to be Secretary of Labor, that he understood that part of her agenda would have been. Yeah, that. that's right. You want me to just yeah. go over and do it all over again? Well, yeah. uh, Francis Perkins, who had been appointed Secretary of Labor by Roosevelt had worked for him in the state of New York as a labor commissioner, and uh, she certainly had this idea of a permanent Social Security Act in her mind. She must have discussed it with him and with Mrs. Roosevelt, and therefore I'm sure that he was ready when it was proposed that the Committee on Economic Security, which planned the act, uh, came into being, that he was well prepared for that. Certainly his speeches were very uh, supportive of the uh, concept. Okay, very good. Uh, do you think that um, FDR was influenced by the national election in 1934 to pass Social Security? Did that have any impact? 
In 1934 and again in 1936, uh, we were very nervous about the elections. We didn't realize the degree of support that the New Deal had achieved. So, uh, what? If I may ask you to, to start that again and just refer, in this case, just to 34. Because well, 36 was the more important election because that was the, 34 was just congressional, but I'll. Yeah, just because in my particular show, I end before 36. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, all right. Uh, in 1934, in the congressional elections of that year, uh, we were very nervous that we might lose our majority, though it seems ridiculous to think so now, but we were unaware, really, of the extent to which the New Deal had seized the imagination and uh, hopes of the people. Uh, whether that it, once we knew that we had a continuing majority, we uh, were more ready to begin on long-term planning, which we did through the Committee on Economic Security. Okay. So you felt, did you feel that that, that kind of gave life, that, that gave the, the, um, the that when the, the elections, when, when you, when the Democrats, the New Deal Democrats received the majority, in the 1934 election, that that Social Security was going to be right around the corner, that it was near to be enacted? All right. Uh, it's hard for me now to recall how terribly insecure we were. We were very fearful we would not win the elections uh, for Congress in 1934. When the elections went in support of Roosevelt and the New Deal, we faced the future with more sense of confidence. Okay. Does that fit in? Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, can you tell me um, about, do you think the Townsend Plan um, influence, had any impact or influence on the passage of Social Security? Uh, the, the Townsend movement was a very widespread and strong movement that proposed that old people be paid $200 a month, and the only condition was that they had to spend it within the month. Uh, petitions were circulated in Congress to bring the Townsend proposal before Congress for enactment, and they often got up to the necessary number of signatures, and then somebody would withdraw. It was a very popular political idea. And in that sense, I think it had a great deal of influence on the passage of the Social Security Act, even though the act did not follow in the pattern of the Townsend proposal. You had said to me the other day that you felt that, um, we got the okay. <coughs> that you thought that the Townsend Act did This is the last take on this role. Um, it was a little bit crazy. And, uh, and then Can you mark it? Okay, let's wait for him to leave. Okay. <laughs> Back on Townsend. Uh, I think Townsend deserves considerable credit for the uh, interest that he aroused in the country, the support he garnered. Uh, but this was also somewhat of a threat to Roosevelt that maybe he would take over. So this uh, fear of Townsend and his proposal did contribute to the passage of the Social Security provisions that were considered sounder and more feasible and more financeable. Was Townsend considered a little bit crazy? Uh, well, some of us certainly thought he, he, he was. He, he was very persuasive. That's right. Can you start again by who's he? I think oh, I'm right. sorry. Uh, Townsend was enormously persuasive with people, had a big following, and while some of us thought his ideas were crazy, we recognized their strength. So there was fear that he might uh, actually uh, get his bill passed and not uh, 
the Social Security Act. So in a sense, that contributed negatively to the passage of the Social Security Act. Okay. Uh, do you feel that the passage, uh, well, do you remember what you felt on, um, on August 14, 1935, when Social Security was passed? Did, was that a significant date in your life? Uh, the passage of the Social Security Act was very significant. Uh, but I was so wrapped up in the immediate... There's an airplane that's very loud. Okay. Okay. Mark it, please. Just a second. Where am I? We're talking, I was saying, what did you feel that... Uh, oh, yes, I know. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so, uh, <clears throat> I was naturally very elated when the Social Security Act passed, though my own work was with people who were my immediate responsibility and my... I had a tendency to look on this Social Security Act as something very much in the future. Uh, later it became a major preoccupation of mine, so uh, this is sort of embarrassing to look back on. But I had 375,000 people I was responsible for, and that weighed in more heavily with me at the time. You said that at the time that you were con that you were concerned that Social Security would be declared unconstitutional. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. uh, another problem that surrounded Social Security was that we had a very unfriendly Supreme Court, and we were afraid that Social Security might be uh, found unconstitutional. So the social insurance provisions were wrapped around the power of the federal government to tax rather than to take care of people. And uh, it was ultimately challenged, and it was upheld. Okay, great. And you had told me before that one of the things that you were sorry about was the fact that health insurance was eliminated. Yes. Uh, m most of the components of Social Security were in the original act and could be built upon uh, as they were in 1938 and later years. But the one thing that the president himself said, let's put it off, was health insurance. He said, we'll do that another time. Well, the time has still not arrived, but I hope it will. Do you feel then the act was somewhat incomplete without health insurance? Yes, I think that the absence of health insurance was a real deficiency in the original act, and I regret that there was this this pressure to put the program in place, and if health insurance had been included, I think it might very well have been started at that time. Okay. Um, do you feel that Social Security and WPA were programs that, that went hand in hand? That, as part of the new program to 1935? In 1935, uh, the president put a great deal of emphasis on dealing with employables in one way and unemployables in the other. WPA was intended to take on the relief of the employables, and the Social Security Act uh, was looking to provide through assistance and insurance for those who were outside the labor market. That was a very uh, clear demarcation in the minds of Roosevelt, Hopkins, Williams, etc. Great. Can you explain to me again, if, if, a little bit clearer, like if you were talking maybe to a, you know, a high school student or something, and what that meant, the two, what it meant to be the employables versus the unemployables? Uh, uh, the unemployables m meant the people who... So if you could just start the, the whole paragraph again by saying that 1935 uh, was significant. Mm -hmm. and that it... Nin 1935 w was a significant dividing place because Roosevelt, Hopkins, Williams, etc., put a great deal of... put a heavy distinction uh, between unemployables and employables. Uh, the employables were those people that we expected to work or to go back to work. The unemployables were those that were outside the labor market. We had a different attitude then toward women, particularly working wives. Uh, 
and they were included in the unemployables in the thinking of the time. I later came to feel that there was no such thing as an unemployable because in the World War II, there were people sitting in hospital beds putting parts together. So it really was a term of the time that the unemployables were not expected to work. Okay, and let's try this one more time in terms of explaining it, and maybe explaining it more, the importance of the two acts being, uh, uh, the importance of Social Security mm -hmm. being passed and WPA being passed, and who they address, and how they intended to um, get at the problems of unemployment. All right. In 1935, we came to a really sharp dividing of the ways between those people that were not expected to work, whom we called unemployables, and those who were, we hoped, going to return to the labor market and work in regular jobs. The WPA had been for the employables, uh, but the FERA covered unemployable people as well. The Social Security Act uh, and the WPA uh, went in tandem because WPA was supposed to provide employment for the, the, those regarded as employable on a more temporary basis. And Social Security was to be the permanent program for uh, people who were not expected to work. The old, the the uh, blind and later all disabled, the widows uh, uh, and, and the wives of, uh, of, the, um, of these people. Okay, and how did unemployment compensation insurance fit into this? Well, uh, unemployment insurance was... I'm sorry, let me ask you to start a different way. Um, when we think of Social Security, sometimes we think of it as only being old age. Yes, pensions. that's true. And, and how, when Social Security was conceived, it included... Yes. Uh, when, so, when the Social Security Act was being uh, framed, primary attention was on unemployment insurance, which was intended ultimately to pay people who were working uh, and who lost their jobs for a limited period of time a benefit to carry them over until they could go back to work in the regular labor market. In that respect, uh, it was a little different from the other social insurances which dealt with people who were not expected to return to work, the old, the blind, and uh, some other disabled people. Okay. Good. Now I just want you to tell me that again in just like one sentence. It's very much shorter. <laughs> that Social Security, that we, you know, Social Security included the un unemployment compensation as well as, you know, the coverage. You don't want me to describe, well. Because you, you just described, you don't have to describe it again. And when All you right. know, just okay. reduce it to its simplest explanation. <clears throat> the Social Security Act also included and at the time emphasized unemployment insurance, which it was hoped would take over paying benefits to people who lost their jobs from the WPA as a, because it would be a more permanent program. Okay. But let's, just, let's try this one more time because it was a little unclear. That, that because of the Depression, people were losing their jobs, right? So um, uh, Social Security covered unemployment compensation as well as um, for, for old age and disability. Uh, during the Depression, uh, millions of people lost their jobs, and the FERA provided immediate relief. The WPA was conceived as an emergency program to provide work for those people who were expected to go back to work, and the Social Security Act included unemployment insurance which was intended to take over after the WPA ceased to exist by paying benefits to the unemployed. Okay, good. Did that do it? Yes. Okay. This is all. <clears throat> what? This is all. Marketplace? Okay. Uh, in... We, we still have... Oh. Uh,
1934? Yes. Sorry. Now we are. Uh, in 1934, a movement developed in California under Upton Sinclair, which was called Epic and Poverty in California, which proposed to uh, employ uh, the unemployed in producing goods and services for exchange among themselves. That was part of our act. We had a pro program for uh, cooperatives. And uh, therefore, uh, when Upton Sinclair declared for governor, uh, Harry Hopkins endorsed him. This uh, caused quite a, a lot of interest. And uh, it, I had not too much to do with that, but at one point, Harry Hopkins summoned me to his office. And he said, I want your fa figures on transients in California because the charge is being made that Upton Sinclair is attracting uh, unemployed people to California. I got out my figures, which were on a large sheet, and I said, well, that it really, I can't disprove that by my figures because there was an increase in transient relief. He said to me, let me look at those figures. He said, you haven't learned the first thing about statistics. It all depends on what you compare with what. If you take this month and compare it to that month, it doesn't show an increase. And that's what we'll use. I learned a lesson in statistics from Epic. And, and why do you think Harry Hopkins did that? The, uh, was it because of his support of Sinclair? Was he afraid that if, if you did say that it was an increase, that that would um, discredit? Sinclair? Yes, it was being used by the enemies of Epic uh, as an argument against it, that it was attracting transients and uh, unemployed people to California. But, and, and, and Hopkins' motivation? Was to see if we could disprove it, which I didn't think we could, but he... Okay. Well. Can you tell me again, in a sentence, what, what, what Hopkins' motivation was in, in mm -hmm. looking at the statistics mm -hmm. or playing with the mm -hmm. statistics? Uh, while the epic uh, pressure was going on, there was a lot of criticism of it, and uh, at one time, Harry Hopkins called me to his office, and he said it's being charged that Epic is attracting many transients and unemployed to California. Can we disprove that? So I got out my chart, which showed the months and the changing uh, transient population, and said our figures cannot disprove that. He said, let me look at that sheet. And he did. And he said, you just don't know the first lesson of economics, of statistics. It all depends on what you compare with what. If you take this month and another month, you can show that there was no increase. So that's what we will do. OK. Um, do, do you, you said uh, earlier when we talked, um, you said there was a lot of, OK, actually, was there a lot of discussion about Upton Sinclair's epic campaign in, in Washington. Did people uh, talk about it, think about it? My own impression is that the people in Washington did not think he was going to win and therefore did not take it so seriously. But that's just my own memory. I, I have no other memories. Okay. Um, and epic was considered a very radical plan at the time, yet the, the concept of production for use is very close to what FERA, you know, was doing. Well, we had a pro we had a, a cooperative a program, but it didn't ever really amount to a very large part of our work. It uh, why I can't really say. Perhaps it required more imagination than we had, but it was not a major part of our activity. Um, again, when you, you said that um, that you felt that that Hopkins was supportive of of, of the ideas of of Sinclair, um, and but at the same time, um, uh, Roosevelt was very. I'm I'm telling you this, and if you don't have any comment on it, that's okay. That Roosevelt was very pulled in different directions on what to do. Should he support Sinclair? You know, should he support Sinclair or should he not? Support Sinclair. Do you have any sense of 
why Roosevelt may have been afraid or concerned that the ideas of Sinclair were too radical that they may taint the administration? Uh, Roosevelt's attitude toward Upton Sinclair's candidacy was obviously mixed because he was the Democratic candidate and Roosevelt's inclination was to support Democrats whenever he could. On the other hand, I think he found Upton Sinclair's ideas too radical, too socialist for his own taste. Okay, but Harry Hopkins, they were in line with his ideas? You know. He never expressed opposition to Hopkins' support. I think Hopkins became uh, a little lukewarm toward the end and did not give it his full energetic, uh, mm -hmm. okay. active support. Okay, but I know that right in the beginning he endorsed it. And he was very <laughs> yes, excited. he did, and we were very surprised. But uh, can you tell me that? Yes. Well, I don't know how to fit it back in. Oh. Just to just start from the beginning, that, that, that when Upton Sinclair won the primary. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, when Up, Upton Sinclair won the primary, uh, the Democratic primary in California in 1934, uh, we were very surprised. Uh, Hopkins actually endorsed Sinclair, which also surprised us because it seemed to go beyond his own ideas of what work, kind of work uh, the unemployed should be be doing. I have the impression that his support for Sinclair diminished as the campaign went forward, but my recollections are unclear. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, just, no, I, no, just ask. Um, would the ideas of the cooperative movement and production for use as it manifested itself in FERA, was that considered radical at the time? Not Sinclair, but I mean, just the same yeah, kind of... Yeah. Well, uh, we carried out the provisions of the Act to support cooperatives, uh, but uh, generally speaking, I think people thought that that was too s close to socialism for the mainstream of American thought. At least it never really took hold. There was a movement in Ohio, I think, and in California, but it was not widespread. Okay. Fine. Okay. Okay. Can you tell me, can we stop for a second? Sure. Okay. I'm going to switch to a. Uh... Mark it, please. Okay. Just a second. Okay, well, now we're going to mm -hmm. change to your direct work. <laughs> yes. Anytime. Um, my particular work was with the transients and homeless, what we would today call the homeless. But at that time, there was the tradition of going west, young man, and people moved toward the west from the east, toward the north from the south. There was a tremendous movement of people. They traveled by freight cars, usually. And therefore, there had been a special uh, pressure for a transient program. And the act, when it was passed, provided that that should be 100% federal for non-residents. So we paid the whole bill. Um, we, it operated through the states, but we had rather definite regulations. Uh, and, uh, but, but the transit one was part of the FERA? It, it, it was part of the FERA. It was actually administered by the state relief administrations, but because it was paid for 100% federal, we had more to say about it than most programs. Uh, by the time we were uh, finished, we had 375 uh, different uh, installations. Some of them were urban transient centers. They were generally short-term shelters. If people wanted to stay put, we had camps uh, where they could uh, do all kinds of things. Our largest camp was at Fort Eustis. It happened that at that time the army was at low ebb. I'm actually going to stop you on this because um, I, you've told me this story before and I can't use it I know, see. In, in, in the film. 
Um, All right. Let me ask you, why was there so much concern about transients? Well, the same concern there is about the homeless today. There seems to be something about people that are rootless, that are moving around, uh, that is very uh, threatening to people. So every time we opened a shelter or a camp, the neighborhood was up in arms and said they didn't want it. And we had to make special efforts to get our places established. I think there's a natural fear of the uprooted person. Uh, we did not have the problem of drugs in that period. There were some alcoholics. There were some old-time traditional hobos. But the majority of the people were just unemployed people looking for work. Okay, because the image, I mean, when you start hearing about... Okay. <clears throat> Last take on this roll. Actually, the two anecdotes I think you told me about, um, uh, about the, the camp with the... Mark it, please. Okay. Actually, before... Uh, I'm sorry. Right. I, I just want to talk for a minute okay, before cut for a we second. start. Mark it, please. Say again. California had a long-standing... Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. No? Yes. California had a long-standing fear of migrants coming into the state. They had actually had a program of keeping them out, of putting their marshals on the border and turning them back. That was appealed to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said that was unconstitutional. So when Epic came along, uh, they were very worried that this would attract uh, criminals, bums, uh, other undesirables. But in actual fact, the people that were going to Al California in that period were chiefly dislocated farmers who had been forced out by the drought, as well as the usual unemployed person looking for work that were drawn to California partly by the old tradition of American homesteaders that if you moved west, you'd find some way to support yourself. Was this, was this frustrating for you in your work at all, to be encountering these kind of negative images? Oh, sure. It was a, day, it was a part of the job. It was constant. Can you explain that to me a little bit? I mean, tell me that you just, instead of just uh -huh. answering me. Uh -huh. Okay, I'll try. Yeah. Uh, this kind of fear, which was aggravated in California, was really a part of the whole transient job. We never opened any camp or any center that we did not have not in my backyard kind of reaction, just as we do today for the homeless. There was a basic fear. Okay. And were, there, were the, were the um, trenches mostly single men, or were they families? Can you tell me? Uh, the transients who traveled on the trains were mostly single men and young men. They had to be to hop on and off of the trains because there were guards that tried to keep them off. The families came generally in old jalopies uh, that they had managed to put together to make the trip. Uh, th those were the chief means of, of travel. Okay. Um when you saw the amount of transients that were, you know, roaming the country, did that affect y your vision of what America was at that time? Were you disappointed? Um, there were never as many transients as people had predicted there were going to be, but those that moved, we tended to uh, extol their uh, traditional virtues of seeking work, that this was the American way. You went west to look for work, and uh, we praised that. Did you have to develop an educational campaign for the communities as well as helping the transients, or was it just not enough resources? We, we, didn't have the, we did not have resources to develop an educational campaign. Whenever we were asked to speak or write, uh, we always said these were just unemployed people looking for work. Okay, great. Um, uh, okay, and the other question of... Um, 
did you feel that this was 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 important? This part of your work, did you feel you were making a difference in people's lives? Uh, our chief satisfaction was in feeding and keeping people alive, uh, because these were the most despairing people, the most displaced. Uh, it was frustrating because we might train people for something. We had projects that did, but there were no jobs for them to go to. So without a permanent source of employment, uh, it was frustrating. When the defense program came along later, uh, we could uh, place people, and then it was more rewarding. Okay, great. Okay. Can you stop, Sure. I can see. See why movie actors get ready. Take ten. Yeah. Yeah. Mark it, please. Just a second. We have to wait till get the frame. Yes. Yes. The depression of the '30s was such a cataclysmic event, with millions displaced from work, no jobs for students getting out of school, uh, families with no source of relief, uh, empty ice boxes. Uh, crying children, uh, that it created an atmosphere of emergency which affected the whole New Deal uh, operation. All of us who were there were constantly aware of this vast cataclysmic event in the country with which we were trying to deal, in my case on an emergency basis, in others of my young colleagues for more permanent institutional arrangements. But we never lost sight of the fact that these were people. Uh, we didn't have very good figures on unemployment in those days. People figured anywhere up to 20 million unemployed. Uh, and then again, you, you were young and energetic, and you were... Okay. Uh, I was very young. Many of my colleagues were very young. Uh, most of these young people, who today are uh, corporation lawyers and so forth, were on their first job. We were uh, filled with uh, zeal, enthusiasm, uh, drive, uh, anxiety, uh, all of the emotions in one great turmoil of activity. We talked, talked, talked. We never thought of anything else but our jobs. Uh, that was just the way life was. Washington at that time was like a small town. It hadn't grown as it is now. So we all knew each other. A lot of us lived in Georgetown, would go to each other's houses. Uh, again, always talking about our work. Great. Um, you're very good at at at, at doing this. Um, okay, one other question. When, in your own personal view, was there was there as, as a nation moved away from the social programs of the '30s and shifted to the war effort? Do you feel that there was unfinished business left, and that the promise of the New Deal maybe hadn't been fulfilled? I'm just trying to think how I'll say yeah. that. Oh, when the defense program came into effect, it relieved us of much of the pressure on our uh, program. But at the same time, it left us feeling that we had not fulfilled all our wishes as to a permanent program. Of course, we transferred our energies to the defense program and became absorbed in it. But still, there was a nostalgic uh, harking back to the days of hope and the New Deal when we thought we were going to construct a new society. So are you saying that you felt like there was unfinished business still about the new society, that the new society wasn't yet? New yeah, I think the new society was somebody's phrase, but uh, I'll, I'll use New Deal. Uh, The defense program was itself enormously difficult, preoccupying for the people who worked in it. But many of them who came out of the New Deal had a feeling of nostalgia for the hopes of, of the New Deal period when we thought we were going to create new institutions that would prevent this from happening again. Okay. But again, do you feel that, that, that there was I still miss I'm sorry. Do you feel that there was still unfinished business? Do you feel that most of the, that you achieved many of your goals or that the war came and kind of stopped 
midterm and achieving them brought out different you know issues but do you think that the goals and the social programs that you mm. worked on were achieved or not let me just say yes. to you that okay. the social yes. security act the Social Security program was sort of fixated. It didn't grow during the war years, should I say that kind of thing? Yeah, just kind of the whole, and the whole social program of that New Deal. <coughs> uh, the defense program was enormously uh, demanding of the country, but many of us felt that unfinished business remained from the New Deal to make permanent and adequate the institutions that we started. Okay? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Can we stop for a second? Sure. We have um, <laughs> 60 feet left in this room. Mark it, please. Just a second. The defense program was an enormous venture, and many of the New Dealers, most of them, in fact, moved over either to the military or to the defense production uh, programs. But at the same time, they had a great nostalgia for the early days of the New Deal when their hopes and dreams were centered on creating new institutions, which were begun in the New Deal, but not fully completed, according to these dreamers, and had to remain uh, in quiescence during the uh, war years until a new generation could pick them up and carry them forward. Okay. All right. Good. Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um,